Hi, welcome back. This is Rebecca Batches. I am a board certified infection preventionist, and I have also achieved my fellow of APIC status. And this is the fourth and final episode of my series related to ongoing typical infection preventionist activities. Today's episode, episode four, is going to focus on quarterly and annual infection prevention activities. My disclaimer is always the same. This is a general guidance for new infection preventionists, which I will also refer to as IPs throughout the video. It does not replace your existing policies and procedures. All healthcare settings from long-term care to acute care to ambulatory surgical centers are unique and they require a tailored approach. My hospital that I worked at is not the same as the one that you work at, and it's certainly not the same as the nursing home down the street. So we need to understand that. The templates I provide are examples only. Please use them as such. As a tip, when you're using YouTube, which is the platform I choose and that you're going to be seeing this video on, you can turn on your closed captions if English is not your primary language. And you can also speed up the pace by using the settings in the lower right hand corner. You can also slow them down if I am speaking too fast for you. Why am I doing this? Because the current state of infection prevention is that many IPs are exhausted, overworked, and under-resourced. Yes, the pandemic is over, but a lot of us aren't over the pandemic. Many IPs are retiring early or leaving the field altogether. In fact, I just heard a statistic from APIC that in the next 10 years or so, we are positioned to lose nearly 40% of our workforce, which is pretty crazy. That means we have an unprecedented number of new and inexperienced infection preventionists in the field. And if you're one of those folks, fear not, we all start somewhere. That's why I've started recording these videos. And we'll talk in this episode about building that community up. Again, the purpose of the training survey, the training series is to provide general guidance on how to approach the average workload of an infection preventionist in the United States. I've never worked outside of the United States, and so please take that into consideration if you're practicing infection prevention outside of the US. And also, this series is based on one infection preventionist, me, experience working in the field for 16, 17 plus years. It does not replace your policies and procedures. It is meant to supplement what you're doing and give you ideas of things that you may or may not be currently involved in. Let's start off. Quarterly activities, infection control committee meetings. I must say, I really always looked forward to my infection control committee meetings. There were times we had better attendance than others. In fact, throughout the pandemic, once we switched to a virtual platform, the attendance at our meetings was better than ever before. And so let's talk about some tips with your infection, infection control committee meetings. First, be sure to review your facility's bylaws to ensure you're meeting the minimal expectations set within those bylaws. And a lot of the times our infection prevention policies and procedures usually include an overarching infection prevention program description. And in that policy and procedure, we might be talking about how often our committee must meet. If your policy, procedure, or bylaws state that you meet at least quarterly, then you meet at least quarterly. And it doesn't matter that there's a global pandemic happening. In one of the facilities I worked in, they failed to meet four times a year. They met maybe only two or three times in one of the calendar years, and that resulted in a citation during their accreditation survey. It's always okay to meet more frequently if you need to. You just don't want to go less than what's stipulated in your bylaws. Next, keep attendance. Surveyors are going to be looking at your attendance list for your infection control committee meetings and they want to see that people who are core committee members are actually showing up. You can have committee members who are ad hoc or as needed, <clears throat> but you are going to be looked at to see who's actually participating in your meetings. So if you're struggling to get attendance at your meetings, make sure everybody understands from the leadership perspective that this is something you could be cited for. And again, as I mentioned, if you're struggling to get consistent attendance, have you tried virtual? It might help people be more flexible 
Maybe they don't have to travel as far across campus. Maybe they're at another facility on the day of your meeting. Excellent meeting minutes are critical to your committee's success. And this is something that we don't really talk about a lot in our general education of infection preventionists. So if you don't have access to an administrative assistant, which many of us do not have, let's be real, or someone who's experienced in meeting minute taking, look online for resources. There are actually some tools now that will transcribe meeting minutes for you. However, you want to be cautious with those tools because they would have to be HIPAA compliant. Because of course your committee meetings are gonna dig into HAIs or healthcare associated infections and could, in, could get into some patient level details. So I would be cautious with any kind of transcription software. The take home point here is that surveyors will be reading your minutes. Your minutes tell the story of your infection prevention and control program, along with your risk assessment and your annual plan and your annual evaluation. But I remember being in a joint commission survey and they read through the minutes with excruciating detail and actually learned about a regional, not just specific to the facility, but a regional multi-state actually hepatitis C outbreak. And they read such a great detailed review of the outbreak and the progress of the outbreak that that was actually one of the things they wanted to talk about in the infection prevention and control accreditation survey meeting. So remember, when you're taking meeting minutes, you always should be thinking about who is potentially going to be reading these minutes. And the whole purpose of having meeting minutes is that people who were not there or have a million other meetings to attend have that snapshot of what was critically important that was discussed at your committee meeting. Be professional, and by that I mean don't be subjective and put your emotions and your feelings into those meeting minutes. Be objective, be clear and concise, a good tip is to always capture action items. So like in the meeting minutes, so-and-so will do X action item by this point in time. That's very helpful. Hopefully that brief, tip, uh, brief review of meeting minutes is useful for you. There are tons of meeting minute taking resources, videos, templates, et cetera, online. So don't be afraid to Google these types of things. <clears throat> Next in our quarterly activities, more meetings. We always have tons and tons of meetings. And these are just examples of the types of meetings I've attended on a quarterly basis in my past as an infection preventionist. They might be titled a bit differently. There's no rule on what these things are really called necessarily. Safety committee. So generally speaking, this is not your responsibility. I hope a lot of us do wear a lot of hats in smaller community hospitals. But typically there would be a life safety officer and he or she would be leading up the EOC or safety committee. And your role as the IP is to communicate any issues maybe with active construction, renovation, remediation, like flooding, and again, any other issues pertinent to life safety, uh, maybe your COVID-19 or respira respiratory virus, emerging infectious diseases, planning and preparedness would be talked about in this committee. Next is a quality assurance and performance improvement. QAPI is the acronym, and the word QAPI or acronym QAPI is commonly used in the long-term care world. <clears throat> I didn't use this acronym as much when I was in the acute care side of infection prevention. The takeaway point is that this is likely in your policy procedure and your facility bylaws that your infection prevention program activities have to be integrated into the facility's overarching QAPI committee. And so there should be representation there, uh, the key points from your committee meetings forwarded through up the chain of communication into QAPI. Next, uh, pharmacy and or antimicrobial stewardship committee meeting. Again, this could be monthly if you're in a large academic medical center. In a smaller facility, this might be combined with a pharmacy committee and the antimicrobial stewardship committee. I always remind infection preventionists that your job is not to own or run the antimicrobial stewardship committee. Every single facility 
that gives out medications, which is every medical facility or healthcare facility, is paying a pharmacist. And generally speaking, those pharmacists are compensated quite fairly. And so they need to take ownership of the antimicrobial stewardship facility. And I, microbial stewardship committee, hopefully alongside an infectious disease physician or someone trained in antimicrobial stewardship. Not every small community hospital has access to an ID physician. Next, state MDRO HAI coordination or NHSN group user calls. I live in the state of Michigan. I'm very fortunate to have an amazing HAI and SHARP. Um, SHARP is an acronym that I'm not going to try to spell out right now, but I have an amazing team of epidemiologists at the state level. And on a quarterly basis, they actually come together and share the NHSN data from the state level, typically in uh, the TAP report format, which is targeted actionable prevention report, I think. Uh, tell me if I got that acronym right or wrong. But in NHSN, if you're familiar, you can generate your own TAP reports if you have enough facility data. But the state HAI coordinators are looking at this from a state level. And generally speaking, this is a great way for IPs to come together on a regular basis to understand where everybody's at. And typically there might be an MDRO update, any kind of pertinent outbreaks that are happening in the community. I know that not every state across the United States has this opportunity, but I do know that every state has an HAI coordinator, at least one. So I encourage you to connect with them and encourage them to meet more regularly so that, again, the state can come together and review um, HAI data and whatever else is happening uh, in the infection prevention world. These meetings are so wonderful and I continue to call into them even though I'm not currently practicing as an infection preventionist in a healthcare, faci healthcare facility today. Moving into observations and tracers, we talked about environmental rounding in the last episode from a monthly perspective, but just to be thinking about some high risk areas that you might want to be visiting more frequently than twice a year. So places that you might wanna be checking in at least quarterly, if not more so, if you have the time, your operating rooms, your sterile processing departments, and anywhere where we're doing high level disinfection and endoscope reprocessing. And so I've given you some resources here in this YouTube video, wherever I link a resource, I'm gonna copy and paste those links in the YouTube description and in the comments. Sometimes the YouTube uh, video description cuts or truncates the links. So look below for the links that I provided here. A couple of things to point out. If you're new to operating rooms, APIC has put together an amazing tool for the Infection Preventionist Guide to the Operating Room. So if you've never been in an operating room, this is such a fabulous document for you to look into. You can also go to the APIC website and look at their implementation guides section. Again, if you're working in ORs and you're new to ORs, I strongly advise that you check this document out. Another resource for you is the CDC's Infection Control Assessment and Response Tools, or ICAR tools. And this link here actually goes right to a disinfection sterilization ICAR tool. This is a screenshot of what that tool might look like. And so you could actually build this into a spreadsheet or there are tons of data collection tools out there like REDCap that your facility might use. Um, if you have a HIPAA compliant version of SurveyMonkey, Microsoft has form tools, Google forms, whatever you're using, there's some way to collect this data consistently. You could build these surveys into a tool like that. But the whole point is that you'd have a standardized approach to doing your tracers. And so check out these tools available to you. What I like about the ICAR tools from CDC is they actually link the source to all of the tracer questions that they're asking, which is very helpful. Moving into annual activities, most important is really connecting with your APIC local chapter. And so most chapters, and I've been to many chapter events in the past year and a half in my new role, 
most chapters are going to have at least once, if not twice a year, conferences where they're bringing everybody together in person. Most chapters have gotten back to in-person meetings since uh, we've lifted restrictions throughout the, the pandemic. And now, of course, it's December 2023 and the pandemic has, has been since declared over for, for quite some time. So just as a reminder, connecting with your infection prevention peers is vital to your success as an infection preventionist. I have made such lasting, wonderful relationships with people in my infection prevention chapter. And to that point, social events and outings are just as important as educational ones. So here is an example of my chapter getting together at uh, Detroit uh, mansion, historic location. And we did a little um, hat hat uh, decorating competition here. So again, a lot of great relationships that you can build and a lot of the people in this photograph are still current um, infection prevention contacts of mine. So don't, don't disregard the fun events. There's a lot of networking that can really help you in your, in your career. And next in annual activities, um, some of those core annual program documentation responsibilities like the annual risk assessment, your annual infection prevention and control plan, and your annual evaluation. I'm sure you're familiar with my original YouTube video, the new IP's guide to the annual infection prevention risk assessment. In that video, there are links to the templates that I show in the video, and many of your peers have found those very useful. So check that out if you need some help with your annual risk assessment. Next, Bloodborne Pathogen Exposure Control Plan Review. This is really important. In one of my past facilities, we were actually cited by the Joint Commission because we were only reviewing our Bloodborne Pathogen Exposure Control Plan every three years with the rest of our policies and procedures. It is actually an OSHA regulation to look at your plan at least annually. And so you really wanna make sure that you're putting the review dates somewhere on the actual policy or plan, whatever you call it. Usually this is embedded into your policies and procedures. And so where you have those dates of review, it is really important. Again, uh, in my past, we were cited for not doing that annually. And since ever since then, of course, once you're cited for something, you never make that mistake again. Similarly, we all should be conducting an annual tuberculosis or TB risk assessment. Even though we don't have to do skin testing annually necessarily, I'm linking a CDC tool for you here. Again, I will put that down in um, the comments as well. Um, but you really want to understand what your TB exposure control plan is. You don't want to be caught off guard the first time you get a suspect or confirmed tuberculosis case. Reading these policies is actually super, super helpful. So hopefully if you're new to infection prevention, take the time, carve out the time to actually read your policies and procedures. Next in our annual activities, the National APIC Conference in June. Check at APIC.org for scholarship opportunities. There are tons of scholarship opportunities. Another way to get to the National Conference is to become active in your local chapter. A lot of the local chapters sponsor scholarships to support their members going to the National Conference. And since the pandemic, we also have an option for virtual participation and the virtual option is wonderful as well, especially if you're the lone infection preventionist and you can't leave your facility for, you know, three to four days at a time. Next, annual activity, visiting contracted linen services. So if you contract out your linen reprocessing, and that's um, anywhere from your environmental services, mops and rags, if, if you don't use single use items, all the way up to your healthcare linens. Everything that's bagged in the patient care area goes, where does it go for reprocessing? A lot of folks don't really know that there is an expectation for inf infection prevention to round at least annually in areas where your linens are reprocessed. I've linked two documents here for you. One is an APIC resource that looks, um, it's an older resource, I think uh, maybe 2014. The second one is actually um, when I was alone or sole IP all by myself, I actually found this online from the Joint Commission website. This is a laundry practices infection control assessment checklist. It was very helpful to me um, when I did my first rounds at a linen facility. 
you will be surprised at what you find. They don't always follow the rules that we would expect in the healthcare facility. So be sure that you, you have your finger on the pulse of linen reprocessing. Don't forget to think about how the linen leaves your facility and how it comes back. They shouldn't be kind of um, traveling, mixing the dirty and the clean linens in the same truck. Just keep that in mind. Annual NHSN training, here's a link. Uh, this typically happens every March, and I believe now this is solely virtual, and so this is multiple days in one week of NHSN training. And really, most infection preventionists are going to be carving out that time because it's invaluable training. There's a lot of interactive, would you call it, case definition exercises. So really check out annual NHSN training. And their past trainings are actually all available as well. So you can look at those videos. Next, uh, your annual NHSN survey. So each year you actually have to tell NHSN, you have to build what you're going to be following um, year to year. And so it's beyond the scope of this episode to get into the nitty gritty of the annual surveys, but basically we're doing that for skilled nursing facilities, long-term care and our acute care facilities. Um, there's also requirements in ambulatory care, ambulatory surgical centers, um, and inpatient rehab facilities. So the take home point here is to understand what your requirements are. My tip here is that when you're building your NHSN plan, don't go clicking all the boxes if you don't actually follow those procedures and events, right? We, we've talked about what the CMS required elements are in other episodes, and I've linked those resources and other videos, but um, some infection preventionists just go a little bit crazy and kind of saying they're going to follow everything that's listed in the NHSN modules. And uh, then you're going to be getting all these error messages like you didn't input data. So uh, just be cautious of kind of what you're doing as you're building that annual plan. Next in annual activities is going to be your annual influenza and COVID vaccination summary into NHSN. Um, healthcare professional module. And so that HCP module is separate from a lot of your HAI data. And again, you wanna work with HR or human resources, occupational health. Uh, typically vaccination documentation should not be owned solely by the infection preventionists. Again, all these other departments have more people than we do, generally speaking. And so we should tap into our peer groups to help collect and monitor this data. A lot, a lot of the times this is way too much for the infection preventionists to own by themselves. Even in a small facility, we've got 300 to 500 employees, and so tracking this can become very tedious. Wrapping it up, I thought I would tag on some triennial activities, so things that happen every three years. Uh, but again, this depends on your facility, so don't take my word for it. Some facilities are surveyed annually, and some, if they have an accredited organization coming in, might be every three years. So obviously, one of the most important things you can find out when you start any job in infection prevention is when are we due for survey, right? Um, so this is facility dependent. Again, uh, fac facilities might have outpatient centers that are actually surveyed annually that is separate from maybe the main hospital. So um, I believe in long-term care, you're getting surveyed annually by the state as well. So again, it's really important to understand um, what that survey schedule looks like, but joint commission is generally every three years unless they find something and need to revisit sooner. Lastly, your policy and procedure review, anything we didn't talk about that's annual, at a minimum, ensure your policies and procedures are reviewed every three years. And again, the review date and organizational, organizational approvals should be reflected on the document. What's that approval process? Who reviews the infection prevention and control policies? Is that person actually um, educated in the field of infectious disease and infection prevention and control to sign off on them? Something to think about. Best practice is to keep at least one hard copy of your policy and procedure binder. Uh, you want to have that at least one copy ready to go for the above mentioned survey. Um, and then you want to keep updated versions of all your policies, um, typically in a way that everybody on the campus can access them. So 
you might keep an extra hard copy in your nurse staffing department somewhere that uh, the bed desk or something that's open 24 seven in case the power goes out and people need to refer to policies and procedures. But the vast majority of us have actually moved to um, online policy and procedure documentation. So thinking about that as well. So this wraps up my series on the ongoing typical infection preventionist activities. Thank you so much for following along. I hope you find these videos valuable. The comments are great and I love to hear your comments. So please share your comments below and look for the links in the documents I've discussed below as well. Thanks, have a great day.